Please take your copy of God's Word. Let's turn together to Amos, Amos chapter 9. Uh, as we conclude this series uh, in Christmas in the Minor Prophets, uh, we conclude with this final passage in the book of Amos. So if you go to the Minor Prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, uh, and we are looking at the last verses, verses 11 to 15. And I've titled this message, The Audacity of Hope. Each week we've been looking at a different passage from the Minor Prophets and asking God to renew us in hope. Uh, And especially when we come to this passage, there's a certain kind of audacity in hoping. That word audacious or, or audacity has the idea of recklessness or a kind of fearlessness uh, that, that sometimes manifests itself in courage, but sometimes manifests itself in folly. And there are times when it seems like hoping is not simply fearless, but even a little reckless. Uh, when we look at our own lives, when we look at what's going on in our world, our own personal world, in our own larger world, sometimes it feels reckless or even a bit foolish to hope. That's certainly the case for the Old Testament people of God as they hear the message of Amos the prophet. And yet, this passage gives us good reasons to hope in our God. But in order to hear with ears of faith and so renew our hope in Jesus Christ, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask him for his help. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we do bless you for your great kindness to us as your people, that you have given us the Holy Scriptures, and you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that as our confession of faith says, you you allow us to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scriptures. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray, come. Uh, Grant us ears of faith this morning that we might hear the word of the Lord in the pages of Holy Scripture. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Amos chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. Behold, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountain shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land. And they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you probably have not spent much time in this prophet's book. So, so let me give you a quick overview here. Amos, the prophet, is he's, he identifies himself in this book as one of the shepherds of Tekoa. He mentions that in chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Uh, Tekoa is a village about five miles south of Jerusalem. So he's from the tribe of Judah. He's a Judean, and yet he's, he's called to preach, not to his fellow countrymen, his kinsmen. He's, he's sent to Israel to preach to, preach to the northern ten tribes, He's ministering in a time of incredible prosperity because of the lengthy reigns of Jeroboam II in the northern ten tribes, who rules those ten tribes for 40 years, and Uzziah in the southern two tribes in Judah, who will reign over Judah for 52 years. Those lengthy reigns will bring great prosperity to both Israel and Judah, But the prosperity simply papered over a number of significant issues. In fact, the the overwhelming message of Amos is that God is going to bring judgment against his people. God's going to cut them down. Why? Why is God going to bring judgment against his covenant people? Well, it's because Israel, the northern ten tribes especially, had violated their covenant with God. Through its idolatry, through its sexual sin, through social injustice, they had brought God's judgment among themselves. 
And so Amos's prophecy is relentlessly negative, uh, filled with oracles of judgment against Israel. Amos chapters 3 to 6, there are four major oracles of judgment. There's an oracle of warning in chapter 3, an oracle of doom in chapter 4, and an oracle of, of entreaty in chapter 5, and then an oracle of woe because of the coming day of the Lord in chapters 5 and 6. And then starting in chapter 7, verse 1, and extending all the way to the verse before what we read in chapter 9, verse 10, there are visions of judgment, visions filled with locusts and fire, visions of plumb lines and baskets of ripe fruit. And finally, in the section right before what we read, you have this clear declaration in chapter 9, verse 8, for behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble shall fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say disaster shall not overtake or meet us. Now, if we had taken the time to work our way all the way through Amos's book to this place in detail, verse by verse, there is one thought you would have had by the end. There's no hope. There's no hope for God's people. No hope for mercy, no hope for grace, no hope that God's steadfast love would somehow bring about a reversal. It would have been crazy. It would have been foolish. It would have been reckless. It would have been audacious to hope that somehow God would either temper his word of judgment or bring a final reversal of it all. And yet, that's exactly what God does. One writer observes the transition between verse 10 and verse 11 in Amos chapter 9 is the most abrupt and surprising in all of the Old Testament. It's as abrupt and as surprising as a new shoot emerging from David's stump. It, it, the transition is as abrupt and surprising as an angel coming to a virgin named Mary to announce that she was the most blessed of women. As abrupt and surprising as the light of the glory of God shining upon shepherds. As abrupt and surprising as God and Jesus Christ by the Spirit coming and taking up room in our hearts and lives. This abrupt and sur surprising reversal that after relentless negativity through nine chapters of Amos to somehow come with grace, to somehow come with mercy, to somehow come with hope, this, this gives us today a reason to audaciously hope in our God, to, to believe that, that in fact all that's sad, all that's sad in our own personal lives, in our families, in our church, in our world, somehow might in fact come untrue. And Amos feeds our hope with this final word of promise that's both surprisingly beautiful and, and attractive. A final word that takes us to Bethlehem and beyond, to the new heavens and to the new earth. Amos tells us about four things in particular that I want you to notice this morning. First, Amos tells us here about a king restored. You see it in verse 11? Your Bibles are still open, right? Look at verse 11. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Now, Amos lived in a time when, when the Davidic monarchy, the, 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 the reign of kings in the line of David, it was still somewhat impressive, but it was, it was actually in decline. As I mentioned, Uzziah had reigned 52 years in Jerusalem, and he offered that the length of his reign and, and the security it offered, it, it offered a certain kind of support for prosperity. But that was simply on the outside. As you might know if you've read the Old Testament, Uzziah was actually struck by leprosy. He wasn't actually managing his kingdom on a day-to-day -day basis. His son served as regent. Uh, in a few short years after this prophecy, Uzziah will die and there will be two quick kings in succession that would bring us to Ahaz and his disastrous reign. And of course, the kingdom was divided. David had ruled over all 12 tribes. But, but because of Solomon's 
actions, and especially Solomon's son's action, David's grandson. Uh, Rehoboam caused the, the divide between the northern and the southern tribes. And so, so the, the Davidic kingdom, though on the outside looked okay because of Uzziah's reign, was actually tottering. It was like a tent in a strong breeze, like the winds we had a couple of nights ago that were blowing through everything off of the back patio, blowing all of your Christmas decorations down. It, it was as though a wind was coming, and the David's tent, his booth, was tottering. But this language of booths, the, the booth of David that is fallen, it actually looks back not just to David's reign, it looks back even further. Because when you mention booths, you can't help but think, if you're an Old Testament Jew, of the Feast of Tabernacles, the, the Feast of Booths that was actually established in Leviticus 23. It was to remember the deliverance from Egypt when, when God brought them out of Egypt through a mediator named Moses. God says here, David's tent, his booth, is going to collapse. It's fallen. But but he's going to do something about it. He's going to raise up, restore, rebuild David's booths. Which, how's he going to do that? Well, just as he restored Israel from Egypt and, and granted them a feast of tabernacles to remember their deliverance through a mediator, he's going to restore, rebuild the booths of David through a mediator, one who is going to be in the line of David. He's going to be a Davidic king. And, and who's going to do this? Is, it, is Israel somehow going to prop up a Davidic king? Is it going to be some kind of machination by the leading generals? No, what does it say? In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that's fallen. God is going to do this. And when is he going to do that? In that day, in the day of the Lord, in the day of judgment and, and salvation, when they come, with, when that day that's pregnant with hope, when that day comes, God says, I will raise up a new king, a king in the line of David, and he'll deliver my people, deliver my people from bondage and bring them under his rule. That's the first thing to notice. But the second thing is not simply that the, the king will be restored, but, but the realm will be expanded. Look at verse 12. So, He's going to repair the breaches, raise up its ruins, rebuild it as in the days of old, verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. So when this Davidic king is restored, he's not simply going to rule over Israel and its original borders, not even in the expanded borders that were promised to David that were actually accomplished during Solomon's reign. No, the realm is going to include Edom. Now that's important. If we had read Amos' prophecy to this point, we would have seen that this, this inclusion of Edom under the rule of, of the king who's in the line of David actually reverses the judgment of chapter 1. In, in chapter 1, verse 11, God had said, Thus says the Lord... For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity and his anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire upon Teman and it shall devour the strongholds of Basra. So God had proclaimed judgment in chapter one, but now here at the end of it all, Edom will be part of God's people. These former enemies will now be reconciled. Those who had rebelled against the rule of the Davidic king will now be brought under the rule of the Davidic king, but not just Edom and all the nations who are called by my name. Don't you see? The nations were always part of God's purpose. Even though Israel and Judah had forgotten that they were to be a blessing to the nations, that through them all the families of the earth were to be blessed, though they had forgotten, God did not. Now, uncircumcised Gentiles from every race, every language, every people group, those alienated for the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, they'll be brought in. They'll be called by God's name. They'll be one with God and one with God's people. 
And so, so the, the reign of this king who's in the line of David will be, in fact, worldwide. Not just Jew, but Gentile. Not just white, but black and brown. Not just American, but African and Asian and Latina. The, the realm will include the entire world and all the peoples. <laughs> how, how audacious this hope is to a people that, that's fearful of the Assyrians on their doorstep, to a people that will ultimately be taken into exile in Babylon. The promise of a worldwide kingdom, it seems to be too much. But not only does God promise a king, a king who would restore, not only does he promise an expanded realm, the third thing you need to notice is that the curse is reversed. God promises to reverse the curse. Look at verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Now, we may not fully understand what's pictured here. Uh, certainly, what we can see at least somewhat is that the earth is producing a, a lavish and spontaneous abundance. But the thing here is, is, is that the abundance is so lavish, there's not enough time to gather it all. There's not enough time to bring in all the corn and the grain. Not enough time to bring in all the grapes. You see, typically... As you might know, those of you who grew up in farming families, the plowmen and the, and the reapers, they don't work at the same time. In, in ancient Israel, the plowman would do his work after the autumn rains, which, which came in October and November. And the reaper would do his work after the spring rains of March or April. In the same way, grape treading would have happened in September after the summer vintage, while dragging the seed through the furrows in order to establish the vines would have happened in November and December. But, but here in verse 13, what Amos describes is the sowers and the reapers bumping into each other because the, the crops are so abundant and, and the land is so eager to grow yet more and more. But in case you miss that, Amos says, the mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. You look at Isaiah 25 tonight or, or Joel chapter 3 later on this afternoon, you'll see similar kinds of promises that the mountains will flow with wine. What is this? When is this? Well, at the end of the age in the new heavens and the new earth, the world will, will be filled with abundance. What does that mean? Well, it means the curse has been reversed. No more thorns, no more thistles, no more struggle against the land, no more sweat of brow, no more frustration. No, Edom will be reborn. And the garden will flourish once again, but the garden's borders will be extended to cover the whole world. The world will be set to rights again, and things will be the way they ought to be. But look around right now. Whether it's in ancient Palestine, modern Palestine, whether it's here in Memphis or the uttermost parts of the earth from Memphis, do we see that? Do we see that right now, that kind of, of prosperity? No more thorns, no more thorns. Do we see that now? No. No, instead we see deserts and arid lands and thorns and thistles. We know frustration and difficulty. We know co competition that's cutthroat. It's audacious to hope, isn't it? For a world in which the curse is reversed, where the world yields its abundance easily and the mountains drip with sweet wine, it's audacious to hope that, that there shall the curse no more be known and we no more complain. To hope that, that God is seen upon his throne and there the Lamb shall reign. And yet that's what Amos pictures for us. He pictures for us a time when, when that rule will happen in such a way that the curse will be reversed. So think of it. The king is restored. His realm is extended. The curse is reversed. But there's one more thing Amos tells us. Namely, this king's reign, his rule, is eternal. Look at verse 14. God says, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. 
They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Never again will there be an exile. Never again will there be insecurity. Never again will there be tears or sorrow or judgment. Never again will God's people hear the words that they heard in Amos chapter 5. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain for them, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and I know how great your sins. No! No, they'll no longer hear that. Now they'll inhabit the land. Now they'll live in their houses. Now they'll plant their vineyards and drink their wine. Now they'll live forever in the promised land. Why? God says, I'll do this. I will restore. I will plant. He's the one who's doing this. He shows himself to be our God. He shows us that we are, in fact, his people. Friends, how audacious is this hope? That this God, whom his people forsook over and again, would be claimed over again. And And that when we might try to run away from our God, our God says, no, you can't run away from me. No man shall pluck you out of my hand. You will dwell with me forever. So ask yourself, when does all this happen? When will it be that God would raise up a Davidic king who will rule forever over a world made new and a people made new from every nation, language, people, group, race, so that, so that we become a people who participate in, in, in God making his mercies known as far as the curse is found? When does that happen? Well, it has happened. Well, when did it happen? Well, it happened with the birth of Jesus who is the promised Davidic king, the king in the line of David. Remember what Gabriel said to Mary? And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and, he, and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of David forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So friends, at the the heart of the message of Christmas is this message of audacious hope, of, of reckless hope, of perhaps even somewhat foolish hope, because God has raised up the booth of David by sending Jesus, God's son, in the line of David to rule on the throne of David and to rule forever. That's what Christmas is about. And yet... The promises are not just fulfilled in the past. Yes, it has happened, but but the hope that Amos holds out to us, friends, it's happening now. You see, Jesus is establishing his rule right now over a worldwide people from every nation and race and language and people group. And the apostles recognized this in the New Testament. If this afternoon you were to read Acts chapter 15... What you'll find there is is as as the saints, the elders, are are gathered at the first general assembly and they're they're wrestling with the inclusion of the Gentiles within the people of God and how Paul and Barnabas' ministry works into all of that. James, who is the moderator of that first general assembly, will quote Amos 9. And he will quote it in such a way to show that God would visit the Gentiles and to take from them a people for his name, to include them within the people of God. And so from the time of the apostles to this very hour, we see people coming to Christ in Belize, in Bolivia, in, 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 in India, in Indonesia, in Mexico, and in Memphis. I mean, that's what God is doing. And when people come to faith in Jesus Christ, what is, what's happening? The king is expanding his realm. He's expanding his realm to include people from every place and race, all kind called by his name. Though we might get discouraged by the world's situation, you have to know that every Lord's Day, as the time zones go across the world, there is, a, there is an uplifting of praise from every time zone around the world. Jesus is establishing his rule right now. And yet, 
These promises of hope, they're, they're not just for the past, and they're not just for the present. No, these things will happen in the future, too. Because, friends, our, our ultimate hope and our ultimate home is a place where the curse is reversed and every tear is wiped away and every sorrow is transformed. It'll be a place where the earth will produce with amazing ease and where colors will be richer and truer, brighter and more beautiful, where the mountains will drip with wine and the valleys will be filled with food. It's a place where sin and sickness and oppression and persecution, blindness and lameness, physical and emotional distress, they'll all be gone. A place where there's no more cancer, no more COVID, no more COPD, no more brokenness caused by the fall. It'll all be gone. A place of ultimate security because Jesus' reign will be eternal and we will all be subjected to him, all bowing the knee, all confessing his name and singing praise to his glory. That place is the new heavens and the new earth. The place of the resurrection, the place of the restoration, that place is our true home. Which means then, this is not my place of resting. Mine's a city yet to come. Onward to it I am hasting, onward to my eternal home. In that land of light and glory, or it shines a nightless day. Every tear from sin's sad story and all the curse has passed away. It sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? We look around us. We look inside of us, and all we see is brokenness and sadness. We know the ravages of sin and the consequences of folly. We, we've experienced, perhaps even over the last few days, the dysfunction of our families and the struggle we know. It seems too audacious to hope for this. Uh, it's too much like Christmases of the past, maybe when we were kids, that raised our hopes so high only to disappoint us. But friend, on the authority of God's word this morning, can I invite you to hope again? To be a little reckless, maybe even a little audacious. To hope in what you've heard, the word of the Lord. Because this isn't Sean's word. This is Jesus' word. This is Amos chapter 9, which has happened, is happening, and will in fact happen. When you bring your hearts and your hopes to Jesus, you bring your heart and your hopes to one who will not disappoint you. You are no fool to trust in him. No fool to hope in him. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, it's so hard to do justice to this theme. To these these amazing promises, this amazing grace that you hold out to us. The Holy Spirit, I do pray that you would take these words and you might somehow drive them into our hearts, that we might believe, that we might hope, and all of our doubts and all of our fears might be driven away at least for a few moments, so that we might truly truly anchor our hearts in these hopes of a new heavens and a new earth and a forever king over a forever kingdom and the curse reverse and no more tear and no more sorrow no more sadness no more parting no more of that lord until that day bring us again and again to the central facts of the gospel that anchor our hopes that once in royal david's city our savior was born and he came to die for sinners like us and was raised again the third day for our justification and is ascended at the right hand of the Father and is coming again. Lord, grant us such confidence in those great facts of the gospel that our hearts might be anchored in hope. Grant us this, Lord, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.